Today we're going to be going over the trial of Christine Ritchie. Christine Ritchie, if you haven't been following along, she is accused of murdering her husband, Michael Ritchie. And up until this point, I didn't think that the state had proven beyond a doubt that she was guilty and not just protecting herself. But today, I think, was a massive turning point. Uh, the state called Janine Bouchard. I'm not sure if that's how you say her last name. Um, Michael was having an affair with her. And when she had a chance to be up on the stand, she detailed the relationship, but also the background scenes of Christine talking to her and just how a little bit unhinged she was. So we're gonna go along together and talk about it and see if that changed the case for any of you guys. Uh, where did you first meet him? Um, I met him at my stepmother's house. And um, did you meet his family? At some point. And did you meet his wife? Th that same time, yes. And uh, did you uh, learn her name? I'm sure. Is her name Christine Ritchie? Yes. And do you see her in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you please point to her and tell me an article of clothing she's wearing, please? A uh, light blue sweater. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Any objection? No, Your Honor. The record will reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. And did you learn what Michael Ritchie did for work when you got to know him? Um, I think when I first met him, I knew he worked for a friend, Mark, doing sprinkler systems. Did you also know that he was a firefighter? I learned that at some point. Okay. <clears throat> and um, after you initially met Michael Ritchie, uh, did you at your stepmother's house? Did you see him again thereafter? Uh, yeah, a few times. And uh, where would you see him? There or where she worked at the BBC. And what is the BBC? Um, a restaurant and bar in Pembroke. Or it's not that anymore. I forget the name of it now. And uh, BBC stands for? Um, British Beer Company, I think. Okay. It was, uh, is that a bar restaurant? Yes. Okay. And how often would you go to the BBC? Um, a couple times a month. And was there a particular day that you would go? Um, my friend and I would meet on like Thursdays, sometimes a Friday. And did you have um, a particular friend that you would always go with or would it vary? Usually. Who was the that? same one, Danielle. Was your job near there or your home? Is that why you chose to go there? It was in Pembroke, but it was in between the two of our houses and my stepmother worked there, so. And when you say in between two of our houses, are you referring to you and your friend Danielle? Yes. Okay. And <clears throat> had you been going to the BBC on Thursdays um, prior to 2018 or was this something new? Um, here and there. It wasn't every Thursday. And uh, did uh, a friendship start between you and Michael Ritchie? Yes. And how did that happen? Just hanging out there. He would be there sometimes with uh, um, a friend, Mark, or guys he worked with. And was Mark, uh, is that Mark McDonald? Yes. And was he a friend of yours as well, or did he become one? He became, um, he was good friends with my dad, and when my dad passed, and oh, when he was sick, I got to know Mark more, and he stayed very good friends with my stepmother. It's fair to say that you knew Mark McDonald before you knew Michael Ritchie? Yes. Okay. And uh, were there occasions when you and Michael Ritchie would um, stay later than friends uh, to talk at the bar? Yes, once in a while. And uh, you got to know him? Yes. And how often, um, and again, we're talking about time period of, um, I'll draw your attention to the summer of 2018, uh, going into the early fall. Um, were you still only going to the BBC one time a week? Oh yeah, no more than that. And um, were, would you say each time you would go there, you would see Michael on Thursdays? Not every time. And at some point, uh, did you and Michael share with uh, one another the state of your kind of personal affairs? Yes. And did that include um, the state of his marriage at the time? Yes. Did he wear a wedding band? No. What would Michael, Michael Ritchie typically drink when you were with him? Bud Light. 
Did he ever drink anything hard, hard alcohol? Not that I saw. Any shots? No. So we know from prior in the case when his kids testified, they noted that Michael had a drinking problem for years. Um, it seems like that had lessened and that maybe he got it under control, but they're still trying to establish that at this time he was still drinking, but maybe not as heavily as he was before. And uh, how much would he typically consume when you would be with him? Was it uh, any amount that concerned you? No, maybe a handful. And at some point after uh, learning about the state of his marriage, did your friendship turn into something more? Yes. And when was that? Um, the end of August, very beginning of September. And uh, did it turn into a romantic relationship? Yes. And uh, how long did that last? Um, it ended Columbus Day weekend, so maybe six weeks. So very brief, from the time that she met Michael and it started to develop into something more, six weeks was the maximum that this affair was going on. And how did it end? Um, he had texted me that, I think, Sunday morning and said, we're over, I need to end this. I will call you later. Please don't say anything, just listen. And did you respond? I don't remember, I think I just said okay. Were you confused? Yes. <clears throat> and um, after that initial uh, text from Michael Ritchie, did you hear again from him that weekend? No. Did you hear again? Oh, yes. Oh, he texted, then he called later that evening. And this was Columbus Day weekend of 2018? Yes. Which would have been in October, correct? Yes. And uh, what, if anything, um, did he say when he called you? Uh, basically, we're over. You never meant anything to me. Um, it was very, like, scripted. So when I first was watching this, I thought that was really odd. Um, seems like that was giving ground to the fact that maybe Christine was forcing him to call her and listening in. And as we continue with her details, we will learn that that was what was going on. Just a few. Objection, Your Honor. Sustained. Move to strike. It's stricken, you said it was over, you never meant anything to me. Yes. And um, did you hear from him again after that? Yeah, a couple months, maybe a month or two later, I had several missed calls one night. I don't know, like in 10, 11 o'clock at night, um, I did not call him back. And then I think days later, there was another couple of missed calls and then another call I did answer. Okay. And <clears throat> during uh, November 2018, so shortly after things ended with Michael Ritchie, who, if anyone, did you receive uh, text messages from? Christine. May I approach the witness, please? You may. three pages, um, just going into the top of the third page, and take a look at that and read it to yourself and tell me if you recognize it, please. that series of text messages? Yes. And what do you recognize that to be? Um, the text I received from Christine. And um, 
is that a fair and accurate depiction of the text messages that she initiated with you on uh, November 6, 2018? Yes. I'd ask that this be marked as the next exhibit subject to are there, uh, is there any further objection to this one? Renewing my objection. I, re I note your renewed objection uh, as redacted. It'll be marked and admitted as Exhibit 32. And what was the nature of her initial uh, communication with you on this text message, ma'am? Objection, Your Honor. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? I'll let it go through it. Could you repeat that? Yes. Could you tell us about uh, this? Uh, may I approach again, Your Honor? May? Oh, well, actually, I don't need to get uh, Ma'am, could you tell me uh, what the text message, uh, the gist of the text message was? Uh, I'll see you at the side of the bench. I'm going to skip ahead. They talk amongst themselves so the jury can't hear. May I continue? You may. With regard to exhibit number 32, ma'am. Um, just showing you that on the larger screen. Is this uh, the initial uh, text message that you received from Christine Ritchie? Yes. Fair to say it's dated November 6, 2018. 10.50 a.m.? Yes. And uh, during the course of um, this conversation, uh, that was the first time she had reached out to you either by calling or texting, correct? Yes. And uh, fair to say she indicates that um, she's contemplated going back and forth on what exactly she wanted to say to you. That's how she starts it off? Yes. And uh, within the body of this text message, um, she indicates that you both had a part to play in this, and she's referring to the affair, correct? Yes. And then she proceeds to uh, tell you of nothing, you have no guilt, no moral, not even respect for your own family, correct? Yes. And um, that you disrespected her, correct? Correct. And now showing you page two. This is uh, fair to say a continuation of uh, the initial uh, text message we were just referring to. <clears throat> and she uh, speaks about uh, people that she knows in your family and having respect for those people. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> and she also references the fact that Michael Ritchie um, owns that he made a big mistake. Yes. And uh, she proceeds to tell you to stay away from her husband and her family, correct? Correct. And that if you see her, you should walk in the other direction, correct? Right. And then the last page of uh, that series of November 6, 2018 message. I didn't think her text messages were that ridiculous. Um, I am sure she was very emotional, and so the text didn't seem to be so outrageous or unhinged that I would find it to be insulting or anything. However, it's communication that happens later that we're going to hear about that I really think makes the state's case. She uh, ends it by saying, um, if you see him, you should do the same, meaning go the other direction, correct? Yes. And she ends it by saying, you stepped into my world, and since you don't know me, I suggest you find your way out and stay out, correct? Yes. And how did you know who that text was from, ma'am? Um, 
just by the context. And then at some point, did you put her name as Christine uh, in your phone so you knew it was her? Yes. Okay. And was that the only text she sent you? At that time, yes. And uh, did you respond to that series of text messages? No. Drawing your attention, ma'am, to um, end of November, beginning of December of 2018, uh, what, if any, missed calls did you receive? Those were the calls. From whom? In the middle of the night, um, Michael's phone. How many times uh, did his phone number call you? At least seven or eight. And this was approximately two months after your relationship ended with him, would that be fair to say? Yes. Did you call back that number after all of those missed calls? No. So it, to kind of draw a line, it seems to be that maybe Michael was being forced to call her and to say these things out loud again. Um, it seems like something was going on with him and Christine at that moment, and that's why late at night he was making all these phone calls. Um, otherwise, there's no other way to justify his continuous calls just to say the same thing that he had already told her. At some point, did you finally pick up the phone after the seven or eight missed calls? Yes. And uh, who was on the other line? Michael. And what did he say to you? Um, again, you, I don't love you. I didn't love you. I love my wife. Okay. And how did he sound? Um, very Objection. monotone. Overall, how did he sound? Very monotone. And what did you say? I just said, okay. And once he ended uh, your short relationship, did you ever call or text him uh, unprompted? No. Did you ever call or text uh, the defendant unprompted? This is no. the turning point for me. Now, drawing your attention, ma'am, to December of 2019, did you see the defendant? Yes. Where? At my house. And uh, that's at 212 Plymouth Street in Pembroke? Yes. And approximately what time of day was this? I, in the evening, I'd say six, seven. Was it dark? So, so we now know that Christine showed up to her house without letting her know, no text or anything like that, never having seen her in person besides one occasion of meeting which was a long time ago and saying that she needs to talk to her um, as we learn she was extremely emotional and i just find it odd that she would want to show up and talk to her without giving uh janine a heads up or anything park outside yes and could you describe what happened ma'am she knocked on the door and I opened it and she said, do you know who I am? And I said, no. And she said, seriously. And, and I realized it was her. So I stepped outside. She said, I need to talk to you. So I stepped outside on the deck. Was anyone else home? I don't think so. And how did she appear? Namely Christine. Um, at first started yelling and screaming. Um, and well, then, yep, go ahead. I'm sorry. So at first she was yelling and screaming. Was she, uh, what was she yelling and screaming? Um, how could you do this to me? This is my, that was my husband. And should I continue? Um, did she say other things initially as well? So a lot of emotional chaos. That's what this communication seems to be. Um, she was kind of all over the place. There was yelling and screaming. There was crying. There was calmness. I had explained that I was that I was told that their marriage was over, that they both mutually agreed to separate, 
that she was seeing somebody else. She wasn't wearing her rings. I would object, Your Honor, and move to strike. All right, which portion are you moving? I'll see you at the side of the bench. I'm going to skip ahead since they are talking without the jury hearing. Ma'am, just getting back to where we left off, um, when you said those things to the defendant um, with regard to um, um, thinking they were done uh, so and things of that nature, what was her response? Behavior. She agreed. And what did you say? I said, well, if you both agreed that the marriage was over and that you had moved on, he was moving on, you had a conversation, then why am I wrong to think that um, that we couldn't date? And she said, because he was my husband. And Uh, what, if any, other questions uh, did the defendant ask you as it related to your relationship with Michael Ricci? She asked a lot about dates, where I was on certain dates. I didn't recall a lot of them. Um, she had asked if he had bought me a birthday present. Um, just more so about dates and where I was and what we did. And um, what, if anything, did she, Christine say about a recent phone call you received from Michael? Um, Objection, Your Honor. Same one, renewed. Same basis? Yes. Um, I overrule the objection for the reasons stated at the side of the bench. You can answer that. Um, she said that she was um, listening in on both so times he called. So we now have that confirmation that she was listening in when he called, and it seems to be that he was forced into calling her because Christine wouldn't let it go until he did. And um, during the course of her uh, visit to your home that night in December of 2019, um, did uh, Christine uh, Ricci's demeanor change at all in the course of the conversation? Yes, there was yelling, there was crying, there was some calmness, there was conversation. And um, during the course of that conversation, what, if anything, were you saying about your part in it? I told her I was truly sorry for my part, that I wished that I had waited for them to truly be uh, legally divorced before anything moved on in our relationship. and. You know, I can't take it back, but I do apologize, and I wish them happiness. And um, how long was your conversation with Christine Ritchie on that date, if you recall? I'd say at least an hour. And how did the conversation end? Um, she said she forgives me, and she asked if she could give me a hug. Did you hug? Yes. And drawing your attention, ma'am, to January 30th, 2020, uh, did you receive a call from uh, the defendant? I had a voicemail, yes. Uh, and what did, did you listen to the voicemail? Yes. And what did she say? Um, she asked if her and Michael could come over and see me and talk because she thought um, he needed that for his therapy. She thought that he needed that for his therapy. This is where I think Christine goes into the deep end. She clearly is not moving on and letting go of what happened. And it must be eating her up because she is forcing Michael to rehash this entire situation and uh, forcing Janine to as well. And that was a message she had left? Yes. And... <clears throat> Where were you when you received the voice message? At work. Did you respond? Um, a little while later, I texted her. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. Um, I had texted her after the voicemail, and then she responded. And is this a fair and accurate depiction of your text conversation with Christine Ritchie on January 30th, 2020 at 1.40 p.m.? Yes. I'd ask that this be marked as the next exhibit, please. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Renewed? Yes. Uh, I understand the objection. It's overruled. It'll be admitted as Exhibit 33. Is 
Thank you. May I publish this and question the witness? You may. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, just showing you what was just marked as Exhibit 33. Um, fair to say uh, that uh, you initiated the text conversation on January 30th, uh, 2020 at 140, correct? Yes. And this, you initiated that text conversation after the phone call you just described, the message you received from Christine Ritchie? Yes. And in uh, this text message, you indicate hello to her and that you just got her message, you're at work, so you can't talk. Um, and then you indicated if you guys want to call after four for a quick conversation, that's fine. Um, and then you further indicated you don't want to see them in person. Is that fair to say? Yes. And. Um, did you receive a text message back from her? Yes. And uh, she, uh, that's a message from Christine Ritchie, correct? Yes. And just so we're clear, at the top of the page, it indicates Christine, and that's how her number, that's how you knew it was from her, correct? Yes. Okay. And in this uh, response, she indicates she understands your hesitancy to see Michael Ritchie um, and how difficult it must be but that they are working on therapy and talking to you is uh, something that the therapist thought would be a good idea. So it's interesting that uh, Christine thinks that him talking with the two of them together is what the therapist said he should do. And I'm not saying that a therapist didn't say that, but none of this is coming from Michael himself. He has not said anything to Janine about this or anything. It's only been Christine texting her or showing up at her house. And the only t the last time they talked, Michael and Janine, it was only because Christine forced him to. For his therapy, is that correct? Yes. And, um... She further indicates in the series of messages that uh, she also had a few things she's confused about um, and um, she wants to uh, be able to get some answers from you, correct? Yes. Yes. She wants to be able to get answers of questions she has. Once again, I think that she is using Michael and the situation to try to get things that she wants and needs. And I don't think it's for his therapy. I think that she isn't letting it go and just wants to keep rehashing something that really at the end of the day, she's not gonna feel any better about. Just moving on to the next page. The end of that text, chain indicates um, basically if she could get some thoughts straightened out, um, she could better help her daughter understand what's going on. Um, and uh, she's not asking to go inside your home. She's just asking for a sit down outside, correct? Yes. And again, as we are seeing this text message displayed, it is Christine saying, she doesn't want this to eat her up again like it did before. She needs to feel settled. This has nothing to do with Michael and his feelings or what his therapist has supposedly said. It is Christine letting this eat her alive and her not being able to get over it. And then you end it by saying, I can't express enough how unbelievably yeah. sorry you are, correct? Yes. And then it continues on and Christine continues to um, text back, correct? Yes. And then she asks if she could, if you would mind if she called you because she needs to get questions answered to piece things together uh, to understand what was happening in Michael Ritchie's mind, correct? Yes. Um, and then you indicated you have a few minutes now. And uh, at that point, she indicates, okay, give me a minute to go outside, correct? Yes. I thought that that was very nice of Janine. Maybe that's not the right word just because of everything that had gone on in the situation. 
but Janine clearly wanted to move on from it and not be a part of everything that the couple was dealing with. And she didn't have to take the time again to get on the phone with Christine and have another conversation with her, but she was willing to do that. And ultimately, did you speak to her on the phone that day? Yes. And uh, did you speak to her? Do you know if Michael was on the phone as well? I don't think I didn't hear him. No. Okay. And what was the nature of that conversation? She had another couple of dates that she needed to know about. Anything stand out in your mind as to a specific time or date she was inquiring about? I don't remember the date now, but I remember when she asked the date, I, um, she asked about the, there was a benefit for Officer Chesna, Chesna at the BBC, and I was out of town, out of the state. I was on a work conference in Memphis, so I said I was not there, so I can't help you. And then the conversation ended, is that fair to say? Yes. And now drawing your attention to March 18th, 2020, did something happen on this day? So, she had, so if you're listening, this whole interaction has been going on for months that Janine has been involved with them. You know, she only had dated Michael for six weeks and now this whole chaos that she's been in has been triple the time of what the relationship even was. Yes. Where were you? Um, I had just gotten home from work. And what are your hours like, or what were your hours like on this particular time frame we're referring to? I know I got home a little later. It, I, my typical hours are eight to four, but if there's a child, you know, actively passing away, I don't leave right away. Okay. And, um, who was at home with you when you uh, got to your home? My daughter. And how old was your daughter at the time? 21. And could you describe what happened? Um, it was the beginning of COVID. So as soon as I came in, I took my scrubs off and I was about to get in the shower. And what happened? Uh, my daughter came into my room and said that Christine was there. And was, do you recall if it was dark or light out? It was at least dusk. I can't remember if it was dark, dark. I don't think it was that dark. Was this a planned visit? Uh, I didn't know about it, no. Okay. So she had taken the time to talk to Christine again to try to help ease her mind. And Christine just again shows up at her house unannounced. And uh, what, if anything, happened next? Um, I told my daughter to tell her to leave, that I had nothing else to say. And then my daughter came back in and said, she said she's not leaving until she talks to you. Um, so she said, I told her that if she doesn't leave, she's going to call, I'm going to call the police. Okay. And I said, go ahead. And then I received a text from Christine. Okay, hold on, I'll get to that. Okay. So as this was going on, uh, you, were you able to see Christine or was she strictly talking to your daughter? Just my daughter. And where was Christine in relationship to your daughter, if you know? Uh, outside, as far as I know. Okay. And you indicated that as this was going on, you also received a text message. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> may I approach? You may. series, uh, three pages, starting with where it says uh, March 18, 2020 at 6.51 p.m. I'd ask you to just take a look at that uh, in the next couple of pages and look up when you're done reading it to yourself and let me know if you recognize it. Yes. 
you recognize it, ma'am? Yes. And what do you recognize it to be? Her text while I was getting ready to get in the shower. And this is a fair and accurate depiction of the series of text messages on March 18th, 2020, uh, initiated by Christine Ritchie? Yes. I'd ask that this be marked as an exhibit. Subject to the earlier objections, um, any other objections, Attorney Wood? Um, no, Your Honor. All right. Uh, I overruled the objection. It'll be admitted as Exhibit 34. And Your Honor, with the court's permission, may I publish and question the witness? You may. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, showing you what's now marked as Exhibit 34, starting with uh, the first message dated March 18, 2020, at 6.51 p.m. Um, is this a text message from the defendant? Yes. And uh, she's texting you while she's at your house? Yes. And she indicates she'd like to speak to you. And then if she, and it says all the cops, um, assuming that means calls the cops, I will have all of it plastered everywhere for all to know. Yes. And it continues on to the next page where she indicates call the cops and we could. So, a little bit of blackmail going on right there, trying to get her way or else she's going to do a smear campaign against her. It's pretty crazy for her to show up there and make demands and then to try to force her into talking with her. Have it out in open court, public record, your choice, correct? Yes. And then you respond. Uh, by saying she got scared, she called already, you could have just called me. Who are you referring to? My daughter. And then, um, again, this is while Christine Ritchie is still at your house that this series of text messages is occurring? Yes. And then uh, the defendant, Christine Ritchie, indicates she asked to speak to you nicely. Um, and she said, meaning your daughter, you were in the shower, and you, she indicates she told your daughter she'd wait at which point your daughter told her to leave. And um, then the defendant says, you could just open the door and talk to me. I know you're right there. I need to speak to you face to face. If you want to involve the police, that's on you, but just know it's only going to hurt you, correct? Yes. And again, uh, just so it's clear, the date of this is March 18th, 2020, correct? Yes. And you uh, indicate there's nothing else you can say. You've apologized as much as you can, correct? Yeah, because up to this point, she had been willing to talk to Christine. Yes. And then lastly, she indicates, but there's a voicemail I have that I would like explained, correct? Yes. At some point, ma'am, um, did you go outside? No. Um, did you um, make observations of what was going on outside? I could hear. And uh, did you hear the defendant uh, when you were inside? Yes. And what were you hearing the defendant saying? Her yelling. Um, I just need to, she, well, at this point, the police had showed up. Okay. And so she was yelling to them, I need to talk to her. I just have a question. And then she started screaming, she takes care of dying children. Do you know who she is? I'm going to put this all over social media. And they kept asking her to leave. And she kept saying, I'm not leaving until I talk to her. Okay. So clearly her erratic behavior can't even be controlled when the police show up. She's outside screaming and yelling to the police. She's still threatening to smear Janine all over the media and it really doesn't look good for Christine. It looks like that she reacts emotionally before she does logically and that does not help her case in this trial. And her tone of voice? Screaming. At some point, um, did the defendant leave your home that night? Yes. And um, how long was the defendant um, being asked to leave either by your daughter or the police before she actually left? Oh, I don't, 
if I had to guess, I'd say like 15 minutes they kept asking her. When the police arrived? The police officers, yeah. But prior to that, she had been at your home for a while asking to talk to you? Yes. And ma'am, how long in total were you friends uh, with Michael Ritchie? Um, I mean, I had met him once or twice before 2018, so I wouldn't consider that friendship, but I'd say eight months. Okay. And during the times you spent with him, um, what if any, um, any observations did you make of erratic behavior on his part? Objection, Your Honor. Proven their point. See at the side of the he bench? He wasn't the erratic one, it was Christine. They now are doing a side bench so the jury can't hear, but with this, with this testimony, it is definitely um, not good for Christine. It seems that she may have been an emotional, erratic person uh, for who knows how long, but at least leading up into Michael's death, she was. And that is gonna be really hard for the defense to come back from that. The trial is going to be wrapping up this week, so it will be interesting to see how long the jury takes to make a verdict. But definitely leave comments below if this was a turning point for you, because it definitely was for me.